Hello friends, I welcome you all to today's lecture on Administrative Discretion, Meaning, Need and Nature. The main aim of this lecture is to acquaint the students with the nature, meaning and scope of administrative discretion. The working of the administration necessarily depends upon discretion. Therefore, it explains why the administration requires discretionary powers. Though the discretionary powers are necessary, but the powers need to be regulated. Therefore, the role played by the constitutional principles in regulating the discretionary powers is appreciable. Discretion is classified to mean an option, election, selection, etc. Therefore, the concept of discretion implies the power to make a choice between alternative courses of action. If only one course of action is available, then the decision is not the result of the exercise of discretion, but the performance of a duty or ministerial. Thus, the function of administration is either ministerial or discretionary. A ministerial function is classified as the performance of a duty in a certain and specified way, and there is no room to make choices. Here, the authority has to act in a simple and strict way as prescribed by the law. Many of the acts performed by the public authorities or the public officers in strict compliance to the rules of the statute, which imposes on them the simple and definite duty in respect of which they have no choice are ministerial functions. In Sharp versus Wakefield, the court said that discretion means doing of action according to rules of reason and justice, not according to private opinion, according to law and not humor. It is to be not arbitrary, vague and fanciful, but legal and regular. Lord Coke in Rook's case said, the discretion is a science or understanding to discern between falsity and truth, between right and wrong, between shadows and substance. The first condition imposed on the exercise of discretion is that the possessor must apply his mind to the case and use judgment to reach to the decision. He must not approach the case with a closed mind and must give the decision on merits. The discretion warrants that the holder must honestly further the purpose for which the power has been given to him and should not use the power for the furtherance of personal interests or for the furtherance of the purposes extraneous or collateral to the main purpose. Now we will be discussing reasons for discretion. With the expansion of the functions of the state, the delegation of vast discretionary powers on the administration has become inevitable. In fact, granting of discretionary power in the hands of administrative authorities is necessary for the effective performance of their tasks. There are following reasons for the grant of the discretionary powers on the administration. The present-day problems which the administration is called upon to deal with are highly complex, varying, and it is difficult to comprehend them in advance. Most of the problems are first of its kind, and the lack of experience to deal with them can complicate the enforceability of the good governance by the administration. Though the legislatures perform exceptional job, yet it is not possible for them to lay down precise standards for the exercise of the powers by the administration. A strict compliance without the room for the future perspectives to the rules sometimes leads to injustice. Therefore, elasticity is to be maintained so that the future contingencies can be taken care of. In the contemporary times, the omnipresent and omnificent administration makes the people feel that they are not governed but administered. The Law Commission has rightly observed that the amount of legislations enacted by the unions and the state impines upon the lives of the people in a variety of ways, and they confer a great deal of the powers on the administration. Therefore, there is a greater need for the enforcement of the rule of the law, so that the executive may not in a belief in its monopoly of the wisdom and in its zeal for the administrative efficiency overstep the bound of its powers and spread its tentacles into the domain while the citizens should be free 
to enjoy the liberty guaranteed by the Constitution. Now we will be discussing need for regulation. All public authorities require powers to implement the law and the policies of the government and to further the welfare activities of the state. The powers without discretion are unimaginable, but unfettered discretion is end of liberty. Administrative agencies are conferred with different types of discretionary powers, right from simple ministerial functions like maintenance of births and death register to the exercising powers which seriously affect the rights of individuals like acquisition of property, regulation of trade, industry or business, investigation, seizure, confiscation, and destruction of property, detention of a person on subjective satisfaction of executive authority, and like. It permeates every sphere of the administration. In Breen v. Amalgamated Engineering Union, Lord Denning observed, the discretion of a statutory body is never unfettered. It is a discretion which is to be exercised according to law. The statutory body must be guided by relevant considerations and not by irrelevant. If its decision is influenced by extraneous considerations which it ought not to have taken into account, then decision cannot stand. Statutory power for public purpose cannot be conferred absolutely. It can be used in the right and proper way only. Whether the discretion is wide or narrow depends upon the true intent of the empowering act. A public authority is not vested with unfettered discretion. Discretion must be exercised honestly and in spirit of the statute. It is not to be arbitrary, vague and fanciful but legal and regular, to be exercised not capriciously but on judicious grounds and for substantial reasons. It is necessary to control the discretionary powers exercised by administrative authorities, to prevent misuse of power, to keep administrative bodies within the bounds and to ensure that exercise of discretionary power does not militate with the ideals of constitution. It is generally accepted that the courts are not empowered to interfere with actions taken by the administrative authorities in exercise of discretionary powers. In Westminster Corporation versus London and North Eastern Railway Corporation, Lord Halsbury observed, I quote, While legislature has confided the power to a particular body with a discretion how it is to be used, it is beyond the power of any court to contest that discretion, unquote. In India also, the same principle was followed in a number of cases by Supreme Court. This does not, however, imply the absence of control over the discretionary powers exercised by administration. The conferment of complete and absolute freedom on administrative bodies often results in arbitrary exercise of power. The wider the discretion, the greater is the possibility of its misuse, and if the administrators are not discreet in the exercise of their prerogative, a number of questionable results may follow. In the words of Justice Douglas, I quote, Absolute discretion is the more destructive of freedom than any one of the man's other inventions, unquote. It marks the beginning of the end of liberty. It is therefore imperative to devise proper safeguards against misuse of discretionary power so that the injustice is not done to any individual. The courts have to take steps for controlling the functioning of administration so as to ensure justice to the general people. The control over discretionary powers of the administration is essential so that there will be a government of laws and not of men. As it is said rightly that every power tends to corrupt and absolute power tends to corrupt absolutely. It is therefore necessary to control discretion in some major to restrain it from turning into unrestricted absolution. Discretionary powers are within the pale of judicial control. A discretionary power is not completely discretionary in the sense of being entirely uncontrolled. In Padfield versus Minister of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food, Lord Reed said, I quote, Parliament must have conferred the discretion with the intention that it should be used to promote the policy and objects of the Act. The policy and objects of the Act must be determined by construing the Act as a whole 
and construction is a matter of law for the court. In a matter of this kind, it is not possible to draw a hard and fast line. But if the minister, by reason of his having misconstrued the act or for any other reason, so uses his discretion as to this act or run counter to the policy and objects of the act, then our law would be very defective if person aggrieved were not entitled to the protection of the court. The House of Lords decisively rejected the notion of unfettered discretion. It is an eternal principle of administrative law that there is nothing like unfettered discretion immune from judicial review. Discretion must be there in all administrative activities, but it should be defined in terms which can be measured by legal standards, lest cases of manifest injustice go unheeded and unpunished. Now friends, we will be discussing the constitutional control of administrative discretion. The fundamental right guaranteed by the Indian constitution play a significant role in controlling administrative actions. These rights lay down the limitation on the legislative and executive power of the government and provide some wide dimensions of judicial control over administrative discretions. The courts always examine the ambit of the exercise of discretion from the angle of its conformity with fundamental rights. The courts also insist on certain procedural safeguards in the exercise of the discretionary power by the administration under the umbrella of the fundamental rights. The courts have used the fundamental rights to regulate the absolute discretion which may be implied when there is conformment of excessive power on the administrative authorities. It is noteworthy that the courts have started taking into consideration the plea of excessive delegation as a ground of attack on the validity of discretionary powers. In Accountant General v. S. Dorai Swami, the discretionary power conferred on the Accountant General regarding the fixation of seniority among the staff was challenged as arbitrary on the ground of its being a case of broad discretion. The court rejected the contention saying that the controller and auditor general is a high-ranking constitutional authority. He can be expected to act according to the needs of service and without arbitrariness. Now friends, we will be discussing relationship between Article 14 and the administrative discretion. Article 14 of the Indian constitution secures equality to all in India. It ordains equality before law and equal protection of laws. Equality before law means all are equal in the eyes of law. And by equal protection of laws, it is meant that law will treat equally all the persons irrespective of caste or social positions and therefore it condemns discrimination. It forbids class legislation but permits classification founded on intelligible differentia which means distinguishing persons grouped together from others left out of group. Persons similarly situated can be differentiated from persons dissimilarly situated. The classification should have rational relationship with the object sought to be achieved by the act in question. At times, a statute may not itself make a classification, but may leave to the executive to make classification of persons in different categories depending upon their level of education, social position, geographical position, standard of living, etc. for the purpose of applying the law. It may confer very broad discretionary power on the administration without specifying any norms or principles to regulate its exercise. The administrator then will be free to exercise the discretion subjectively, arbitrarily or capriciously. The conformment of an arbitrary and unregulated discretion violates Article 14 as it creates danger of discrimination among similarly situated which is subversive of equality mandate. If a statute does not disclose a definite policy or object, subject to which the discretion conferred is to be exercised, then the statute is discriminatory and is open to challenge on the ground that it confer wide discretionary powers on administrative authority. The court will strike down the statute if it does not provide any guidance for the exercise of the discretion in the matter of selection or classification. 
this satisfies the doctrine of rule of law. In Air India v. Nargis Mirza, the Supreme Court observed, it is a time that a discretionary power may not necessarily be a discriminatory power, but where a statute confers a power on an authority to decide matters of moment without laying down any guidelines or principles as norms. The power has to be struck down as being violative of Article 14. Similarly, in Hamdar Dawakhana v. Union of India, one of the questions raised was whether Section 3, Clause D of the Drugs and Magic Remedies Objectionable Advertisements Act 1954 conferred excessive powers. The Supreme Court held that the power of specifying diseases and conditions as given in the impugned provisions conferred arbitrary powers as Parliament has established no criteria, no standards and had not prescribed any principle on which a particular disease or conditions was to be specified in the schedule. It was not stated what facts or circumstance were to be taken into consideration to include a particular condition or disease in the schedule. In Kedarnath v. State of West Bengal, the law setting up special courts mentioned the offences triable by them, but gave a discretion to the government to allot cases for trial by these courts. Under the statute, any particular case would be allotted to or withdrawn from a special court. It was argued that the provision vesting an unfettered discretion in the government to do so was discriminatory and therefore not valid under Article 14. It was argued that the law did not disclose any reasonable classification as to the offences mentioned. These arguments were rejected by the court. The court stated, I quote, There may be endless variations from cases in the fact and circumstances of the same type of offences. And in many of these cases, there may be nothing that justifies or calls for the application of the provisions of the Special Act. In Ajay Hasia v. Khalid Mujib, the Regional Engineering College made admission on the basis of oral interview after a written test. The courts held that allocation of one-third of total marks for interview was arbitrary and violative of Article 14. The oral interview cannot be regarded as a very satisfactory test for evaluating the caliber as it is subjective and capable of abuse. It cannot be the exclusive test. It should be resorted to only as an additional or supplementary test, and it is to be tape recorded to judge whether it was conducted in an arbitrary manner. In Manika Gandhi v. Union of India, Section 10, Subsection 3, Clause C of the Passport Act 1967 was challenged inter alia to impound a passport of a person in public interest under Article 14 as there was no appeal against the order of the government and the words in the interest of the general public were vague and undefined. The court upheld the provision by reading down the requirement of natural justice therein and also because the words in question could not be characterized as vague and undefined as the court is well aware of the meaning of these words. These words provided sufficient guidelines to the government and its power cannot therefore be regarded as unguided and unfettered. The reason for impounding the passport are to be recorded in writing and a copy of it is to be given to the affected persons save in certain exceptional circumstances. The power is vested in a high authority and according to the court, when power is vested in a high authority like the central government, abuse of power cannot be legally assumed. In Suman Gupta v. State of JNK, with a view to encourage national integration, certain state governments agreed as a matter of policy to reserve certain seats in medical college for outside candidates nominated by the respective state governments on a reciprocal basis. The Supreme Court struck down the vesting of power of nomination in the state governments as a nomination was left to their unlimited discretion and uncontrolled choice. Friends, now we will be discussing relationship between Article 19 and the administrative discretion. Article 19 guarantees six freedoms, that is freedom of speech and expression, freedom to assemble peacefully and without arms, freedom to form association, 
freedom to move throughout the territory of India, freedom to reside and settle in any part of India, freedom of carrying on any trade, business or occupation or to practice any profession to the citizens of India. And these freedoms are not absolute. Therefore, reasonable restrictions can be imposed on these freedoms. This means that none of the freedoms can be curtailed merely by an executive fate and it is necessary to have a law to back the administrative action. The restrictions have to be reasonable and the reasonableness of the restriction is open to judicial review. A restriction to be valid must have a rational relation with the purpose for which the restriction can be imposed under the relevant constitutional provisions. The general principle is that unguided or arbitrary discretion without any procedural safeguards on the legislative policy should not be given to an administrative officer to regulate the freedom of speech and expression. In Babulal Parate v. State of Maharashtra, the Supreme Court upheld a statutory provision giving power to the executive to impose restrictions on freedom of speech and expression as the statute contained safeguards against such restrictions. In Himmatlal v. Police Commissioner Ahmedabad, Rule 7 of Section 33 of the Bombay Police Act 1951 was struck down by the Supreme Court. Rule 7 provided that no public meeting shall be held on a public street unless a written permission has been obtained from an officer authorized by the Commissioner of Police. The rule did not provide considerations for the exercise of the power by the authorities, nor did it provide the procedural safeguards against the misuse of the power. The court therefore struck down the rule as it conferred arbitrary powers on the official concerned. Now friends, we will be discussing relationship between Article 21 and the administrative discretion. Article 21 provides the right to life and personal liberty to persons which can be denied as per the procedure laid down by the law. Initially, the procedure established by the law meant that procedure which was laid down by the competent legislative bodies irrespective of its harshness. But in Menka Gandhi v. Union of India, the Epic's Court opined that it includes the principles of natural justice and thus softened the rigors of law. In Air India v. Nargis Mirza, the court struck down the discriminatory provisions in the service rules which provided that an air hostess can continue in service up to the age of 35 and the same could be terminated if she contracts a second marriage or on the first pregnancy. On the point of restriction on marriage, the court upheld the rule on the reasoning that it can prevent ad hocism, foster family planning and the females will be more mature to attend to the matrimonial ties. Whereas the court took a serious note of the restriction on pregnancy as it directly interferes with the ordinary course of human nature and abhorrent to the notions of civilized society in addition to being an insult to Indian womanhood. In Malak Singh versus State of Punjab, the police entered the names of two persons in the surveillance register under the Punjab police rules. The persons challenged the inclusion of their name in the register on the ground that they being the active members of a political party were falsely implicated in civil and criminal cases by the police at behest of leaders of opposite party. Moreover, no opportunity of hearing was given to them before the inclusion of their names in surveillance register. The court opined that surveillance entry is a confidential matter and therefore the principle of natural justice cannot find application. Moreover, surveillance has the tendency to invade right to privacy. Therefore, it cannot be intrusive but unobtrusive and within bounds. While concluding, it may be said that where the act provides some general principles to guide the exercise of the discretion and thus save it from being arbitrary and unbridled, the court will uphold it, but while the executive has been granted unfettered power to interfere with the freedom and fundamental rights, the court will strike down such provisions of law. Thus, courts have used the mechanism of fundamental rights to control the administrative discretion. In fact, fundamental rights are very potential instruments which the judiciary can go a long way 
in warning of the dangers of administrative discretion. With this, I conclude today's lecture. Hope you have understood fully. Thank you.